Want to patent your invention? The chance is near. You've given it heart. Now get it in gear. It's Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. I'm Richard Gearhart. I'm Elizabeth Gearhart. Welcome to Passage to Profit, the inventor show, where we're all about small businesses, entrepreneurs, and the intellectual property that helps them flourish. And Passage to Profit is sponsored by this guy, Gearhart Law. <laughs> <laughs> which is a full service intellectual property firm, patents, trademarks, copyrights, litigation, and he loves to help people with their intellectual property problems. Yes, we absolutely do. And thank you for that unbiased endorsement. <laughs> I really appreciate it. So we Someone have had to say it. <laughs> a, a super great show today. I'm so excited. We have Misty Wrigley Miller, who is going to be our guest. She's a fantastic guest, has incredible experience and has done lots of interesting and wonderful things. And then also on our slate of guests today is Jack Killian. Jack is also the master networker. He's a great guy and can do lots of things to help entrepreneurs succeed. Absolutely. And he has a new venture to do just that. And then Kenya's going to give her power move segment. I'll talk a little bit about my startup fireside. And then we have two awesome presenters. So Sarah, I wish you'd been around when my kids were little. Sarah has got this amazing <laughs> app to help your kids get transportation and I'm not going to say anymore. I'm going to let her talk about it. But anybody that deals with kids or grandkids, you want to stick around and hear this. And then if you are a small business owner, even if you're just on Etsy, you know, I know Etsy's getting pretty big now. Lee can save you tons of money on your shipping and save your customers money. So like I know when I go to buy something, I don't want to pay a big shipping fee. So stick around and listen to how you could save money with Lee if you're mailing anything at all. And we're getting closer to a perfect world, aren't we? Are we? Well, with the free shipping. Oh, yeah. Low cost and free. <laughs> well, really, I mean, these big carriers get these huge discounts and the and small carriers have been able to get them and now they can through yeah, me. Yeah, and why so, shouldn't they? Well, they should. Let's, Let's go. go on to IP in the news. Oh, gosh. I'm going to hold this up, but we'll also splice it in. Listeners, go to our social media, Passage to Profit Show, and look at this because I think it's hilarious, but it's something pretty cool. I'm holding this in front of my face. It is a dog wearing a watch. So in 1991, a patent was issued, patent 5,023,850 for animal time watches. So basically what this does is it's a watch that gives you the time passing in dog time or any other animal. So right. So one year of human time is equal to seven years of dog time, right? That's, that's the metric. Except for the year 2020, which is equal to about a million years of any time. <laughs> Will it ever end? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully soon. But yeah, so if, if you want to get a watch for your dog and they can keep time in dog years, since it runs more quickly for dogs, if, for example, if you're watching a TV show with your dog and it's an hour long, it's really seven hours long to your dog. So keep those things in mind when you're dealing with your pets. I actually think this is pretty cool, though. But the patent is very technical with all these electronics and everything. But it has a picture of a dog wearing a watch and looking at it. So that'll be on our social media. Yeah, the picture sort of looks like Winston Churchill. <laughs> okay, so on to the copyright. This is really interesting. I bet you didn't know you could copyright an oomph. A sound. A sound. Of course, this is America. People find all sorts of ways to sue each other. It turns out that a gamer created a particular oomph sound whenever the character in the game was killed. And it became very distinctive and other gamer companies started copying the software sound of that oomph. So naturally this was something that they had to go to court over. And it turned out that they were able to settle the case and the winning party received a license, I guess, for every time the word oomph is used in connection with the death of a video game character. So just be <laughs> alert out there. There may be things that you're saying or doing right now that are worth a lot of money and you don't even know. <laughs> yes. I was gonna say if I'd have known how to tape some of those sounds I made during childbirth. <laughs> anyway, let's introduce Misty. Misty Wrigley Miller is a lifelong horsewoman, not only an award-winning broadcast journalist, but also one of the few women in the world to compete with a team of horses in the sport of combined driving. More on that in a little bit, I'm sure. Amongst her many equestrian achievements, she and her American saddlebred, H.S. Baby Steps, won an incredible four championships. She's also the owner of the Wrigley Media Group. You're kind of at both ends of the spectrum there, right? You're a champion equestrian and you're also in the media business 
was, how did you figure out which that you were going to go in these two directions? Well, it was the way I was raised because from my mother's side, I got gum, baseball, and Arabian horses. <laughs> and from my stepfather's side, I got television, news, and Walter Cronkite. So <laughs> I had both of these great elements in my life growing up. Right. If you've ever been to Chicago, if you've ever been to Wrigley Field, that's who she's talking about. That was her grandfather that did that. And also the Wrigley Gum Fortune. So Misty grew up with entrepreneurs, with people that were involved in their communities. And she's giving back now. She's keeping the family tradition going, which I think is awesome. Yep. It's very important for me. You're obviously a successful entrepreneur and you have a media group. So what exactly does your media group do? We produce all sorts of content, long format, short format, over several different platforms. I like to say that we're problem solvers and whatever the client needs, whether it be a training video for Toyota or when Drew Barrymore needed a scene in her new movie of a small Kentucky home, that we provide solutions. And we have an amazing array of talent. We call ourselves media mavericks because we kind of burst through all the boundaries in order to solve our clients' problems. So who is a typical client? Do you work with any small businesses or are they typically people that are in the upper range? We work with people in all business ranges. We do work for nonprofit groups, which was especially important during the COVID months, which we're still in and beginning to see an uptick, um, all the way to large networks. We're currently working on a couple of projects for HGTV. What is the biggest struggle that these entrepreneurs have when it comes to this kind of media exposure and content? I think it's getting their correct message through to the correct audience. And that's what we really try and help our clients develop because they'll come to us maybe, you know, just not really knowing what they want their message to be. So we really take a lot of pride in working with our clients very closely and crafting that message and make sure that it gets out on the correct media platforms. How does the process of deciding that work? Normally the client will meet with a person on our creative team and they just work through that message. A recent example was a friend of ours owns a distillery and they wanted to get the message out that they were shifting, pivoting from producing bourbon to producing hand sanitizer, which was a great thing to do for the community. And they wanted to get their message out. Wow. So we went in and following all the COVID protocols. And I'm really grateful to all of our producers who went out in the community, you know, properly masked and sanitized. And we had t-shirts made, you know, lights, camera, sanitize. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but to work with that company to say, hey, these are really tough times and we're pivoting our business to let people know that we're now producing hand sanitizer. So we did a great video and put it up on their social media and it sort of went viral. So I'm just interested, what platform of social media was it? Instagram? Was it Facebook? And do you know why it went viral or was there anything you did that helped it go viral? Well, we put it on Facebook and on their social media. I think that what helped it go viral was not only the message, which was great. Hey, you know, sorry, your bourbon's on hold, but right now hand sanitizer is <laughs> more important. But you know how they did it, why they did it. And I like to think that our shooters created such compelling video images in a very short amount of time. We call it snackable content. I'm from an age, you know, I used to think snackable content was a bag of Cheetos. But <laughs> <laughs> snackable content before. <laughs> snackable content is, you know, what's so popular on social platforms now that you just have such a short amount of time to number one, catch the viewer's attention and get that message across because I've got some brilliant younger people working for me, they understand how to get that message grabbed and understood and get a reaction. So what would be some must have platforms that content creators should absolutely have as part of their content strategy today, you would say? Absolutely. Facebook, YouTube, and their own strong web presence on their own website. And we do a lot of work with people developing their website and that distribution, getting it out to their audience. You've been in the media world, but you've also been in the equestrian world too. You're a champion in the sport of combined driving. So I guess I never really think of horses and driving in the same sentence, but but can you tell us a little <laughs> bit about that? It's a very challenging sport. It's a three-day event in three different phases. So it takes a lot of courage and stamina 
to get mm-hmm. through the three days of competition. But one of the things I really, really enjoy about it is that in equestrian sport, men and women compete equally. We're not divided. And amateurs and professionals compete against each other. So it really is just true, true sportsmanship at its most basic level, true horsemanship at its basic level. And I think because I was raised in equestrian sport, I never really gave much thought to, as a woman, I can do this or I can't do this. And I'm one of six women who compete internationally in the sport of foreign hand driving. And people say, don't you find that odd? And I don't because no one ever told me that I couldn't. So why do you think there's not as many women participating in the sport? I think because there's a sort of a image that, okay, there are four strong horses and women aren't strong enough. They don't have the stamina and, you know, they certainly can't keep it up, you know, that, that level of competition for over three days. And we absolutely can. And I'm not even a young woman, (laughs) but you know, it's the proper training. It's your mental fitness. It's your physical fitness. It's your relationship with your animals and becoming the first woman to win a gold medal in that sport, I think is hopefully I've set an example for other women saying not only can you compete, but you can compete at the top of your game. Horse is drawing a cart, right? And it can be two, three or four horses. And you have to control all those horses from the cart. Is that right? Yes, I drive four horses put to a carriage. We use two different types of carriages for the different events. One carriage is very old fashioned and it looks like something you'd see in Downton Abbey or something like that. But it's it's very, very technical. And then our marathon carriage that we do the cross country, we have to navigate obstacles over about 23 kilometers, very high tech. And believe me, while they may all look the same, same. It's sort of an engineering feat to figure out how you can make your carriage turn a little faster. And I mean, we've got delayed steering and front and rear disc brakes and uh, it's all yeah. kinds of gadgets on these things. Sort of like yeah. Formula One for horses. Exactly. How fast can um, you some, Probably the optimum speed is between 16 and 18 kph, which is probably about 14 to 16 miles per hour. That's optimal. You've been so successful. What do you think you could tell people who are trying to run a successful business or start one? Again, I will lean on one of my favorite expressions, and I'll give this one to Audrey Hepburn. Whether you think you can or you think you cannot, you are correct. (laughs) I love that. (laughs) That is excellent. Great. But we have lots more to go. If anyone's just tuning in, our podcast is out tomorrow. Passage to Profit show on iHeart. And we also have our social media, which is on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. And you can see what we're talking about with the different graphics that we're going to intersperse through the show. Check out the dog with the watch. Yeah, check out the dog. It looks like Winston Churchill. (laughs) So so we'll be right back. You're listening to Passage to Profit, the inventor show on WOR 710, the voice of New York. What are entrepreneurs' most valuable assets? Their passion and ideas. We can't protect your passion, but we can protect your ideas. Trust Gearheart Law to protect your ideas with premier patent, trademark, and copyright services. There's never been a better time to start your own business. Contact us at GearheartLaw.com. At Gearheart Law, we have years of experience protecting entrepreneurs' ideas and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at Gearheart Law, www.gearheartlaw.com. Don't let the wrong protection strategy ruin your business. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection and are licensed and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Contact Gearheart Law on the web at G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W.com. Together, we can change the world. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. Now back to Passage to Profit. Once again, Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. And we just had a really wonderful segment with Misty Wrigley Miller, equestrian and entrepreneur. And for our next guest, we have Mr. Jack Killian, master networker. He's the founder of Street Smart Entrepreneurs and the Jack Killian Group and has been an entrepreneur, get this, for over 45 years. Still you think going it, strong. You I think you'd be tired of it by now, but he's not. (laughs) And he's grown multiple diverse businesses and strategic businesses, and he's provided guidance to hundreds of entrepreneurs. A good friend of ours. Welcome, Jack. Good to see you. And also a veteran. 
And also a veteran. Today is Veterans Today's, Day. We're taping this on Veterans Day. Yes, November 11th, 2020. Uh, 2020. So um, thank you, Jack, for your service to our country. Great. I, I would describe myself as a veteran veteran. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about what you're up to lately and the types of things that entrepreneurs need help with. Over the last 45 years, I've started nine different companies, all of which made it to varying extents. And then I also purchased the financial actually uh, messed up family-owned manufacturing company that I turned around and ran that for 13 years. And all those experiences led me to start my latest new venture, which is called Street Smart Entrepreneurs. And when I look at COVID-19, I see all the terrible things that it's creating, but I think it's also going to create some major positive developments globally. And I think for sure it's going to boost entrepreneurship globally. And I want to be part of that movement. I want to make my contributions into the entrepreneurial space. So I started Street Smart Entrepreneurs about five or six months ago. And what we're currently doing is developing online and in-person courses for entrepreneurs, events for entrepreneurs. We're doing some strategic consulting, both with entrepreneurs and with larger companies. Down the road, I can envision even uh, creating a, uh, one or more incubators for entrepreneurs and possibly even an investment fund to uh, invest in some of the opportunities that we come across. And I'm in the process of uh, writing a book that summarizes the things I've learned with all these various ventures. And the working title of that book is called Been There, Done That, because I literally think that I've been there and I've done that. I've raised money for deals. I've bought companies, sold companies, merged companies, closed companies that belong to uh, other entrepreneurs. I've started new ventures in venture capital. That was my first five-year new venture. That morphed into uh, starting a magazine. We started the first country music magazine in America. And Misty, you might be interested. We, we teamed up with the Minneapolis Star and Tribune Company. They became the investor in that new deal. And they hired our three-man partnership to go in and try to turn around Harper's and help them sell it at the time. So I was involved in running Harper's. That was following my dad dropped dead. I had to uh, jump in and start running his company the day after he passed away. And when I got there, it had $23 in the bank, owed about $2 million, most of it personally guaranteed. So I had to take a company from that state and I ran it for 13 years. I never raised a dime of outside money. And I eventually sold it to a public British company, went on their board, and we did 10 high-tech acquisitions in three years and then sold that company. Then I uh, morphed into helping an ex-McKinsey friend of mine start a magazine in a wireless and mobile communication space. I stayed with that for about five years until we sold it. And that morphed into uh, me starting a technology-focused hedge fund which I was with for three years. I was one of the co-founders. And I evolved that into starting a fund of funds that I ran for 18 years. And I closed that at the end of 18 when I ran into some health issues. And I just didn't feel comfortable managing money for other people while I was dealing with health issues of my own. Then I spent five years consulting and teaching people how to network and build alliances. So the first book I wrote was about networking. It's called Network All the Time, Everywhere with Everybody. So I've coached uh, clients in places like Deloitte, J.P. Morgan Chase, Colgate, Palmolive, maybe a dozen universities. And if I had a couple of key things to offer as advice to other entrepreneurs, it would certainly be to learn how to network and build relationships and create strategic alliances because that's where you're going to learn that's where you're going to get new ideas. That's how you're going to be able to leverage scarce resources that every entrepreneur deals with. I've lived and worked in France and in England, and I've taken some of these ventures globally pretty successfully. So I'm always available to help other entrepreneurs. And one of the issues that I'm wrestling with right now for street smart entrepreneurs is how do we really find the entrepreneurs that are going to be motivated to improve their abilities to grow a successful company? Entrepreneurs need to have a competitive edge. And I see a lot of deals in the marketplace where they don't really have a strong, sharp competitive edge. And one thing I always talk to entrepreneurs about is you better be prepared to be your 
your company's best salesman because that's a key component of being successful, of starting and growing new ventures. The top person always has to be capable of being an exceptional salesperson. You can't simply outsource that. And then, as I said, you got to be really strong at networking and de- developing strategic alliances. And I think uh, COVID has made that even easier by spurring the use of uh, Zoom so we can create alliances around the world. And I'm certainly doing that for street smart entrepreneurs. I think you start with having a passion and a vision for being prepared to step off the ledge. The early part of my career was pretty traditional. I went to really great colleges. I went to Yale, MIT, and Harvard. Then I had a very good job in England with a British tech company. Then I came back to the States and I was with McKinsey which is certainly a good place to be. But it wasn't what I really felt in my heart I wanted to do. So at the time, uh, one of the partners at McKinsey started talking about nominating me as a partner. That made me sort of think about what I want to do. And that same night, I was working late and I called my wife up and I said, I just made two decisions. And she said, what are they? I said, we're going to buy a racehorse. And she said, what are we going to do that? I said, God only knows because we don't have any money. So We'll have to find an inexpensive racehorse. And she said, what else did you decide? I said, I'm going to quit my job. And she said, what are you going to do then? I said, tomorrow. <laughs> and she said, why? And I explained why. I, I said, you know, I just don't want to lead the partners at McKinsey down a path that I'm really going to be interested in being a partner. So if I'm not going to do that, I might as well try to find what I want to do. I have a passion for small businesses. I've written my thesis at MIT about working with small companies. So I said, I'm going to leave and try to start a company to work with other entrepreneurs to raise funding for their deals. And it took me about three or four months to exit McKinsey, but that's what I did. And when I left, I had no partners, no real money, no business cards, no office, no experience doing what I wanted to do, and no network of people to work with. So I was really starting cold turkey, but that's where I really started to learn the importance of meeting people, building alliances, looking for ways to give back to people. And that's really where I got my PhD in entrepreneurship, looking at a thousand deals, you know, 98% of them, which were not very interesting. The most interesting one that we got involved in was helping launch Rolling Stone magazine. So we we saw that as a pretty compelling business case. I had consulted with Columbia Records and Clive Davis. So I had a little bit of background. My partner was from Texas and is a country music fan. So we decided to go raise money to start Country Music Magazine. And that publication ran for over 30 years. So I think you have to have a passion. The key thing is you have to have support at home. You can't be out trying to be an entrepreneur when you're struggling to have that kind of support at home. It really creates a drain on on you physically and emotionally, and you have to be prepared to deal with that. So Jack, we really enjoyed listening to you and your story. I can see why you would title your book, Been There, Done That, because you have been there and you have done that. Right. And it's always a great pleasure to meet with you and to speak with you. And thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity. It's great. We'll be back right after this commercial announcement. This is Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gerhardt. There's never been a better time to start your own business. The opportunities are infinite and only limited by your imagination and enthusiasm. At Gearheart Law, we believe the most successful companies all have one thing in common. They start with a solid foundation first. Gearheart Law. Law has years of experience protecting entrepreneurs, ideas, and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at www.gearheartlaw.com. Our professionals will create a custom strategy designed to fit your needs and your budget. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection, licensed, and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Visit GearHeartLaw.com. Together, we can change the world. Visit G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W.com. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. 
Passage to Profit continues with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. We have with us Miss D. Wrigley Miller and, of course, Jack Killian, entrepreneur extraordinaire. Next up is Power Move. And so for that, we turn things over to our co-host, Kenya Gibson. I appreciate that, Richard. Thank you so much to you and Elizabeth. Really enjoying the conversation today with Misty and Jack. You know, Misty was talking just about creating content and making it good and making it engaging. And Jack was talking a little bit about his experience with Clive Davis in the music industry. So I think the young lady who we're going to talk about and highlight on Power Move today is a super good fit. Her name is Goldie Harris. She is a young creator in the event space. She was actually given her first budget of $120,000 to create an event in college. And that doesn't sound like maybe a whole lot of money, but when you're in college and you're responsible for, you know, taking $120,000 and creating a music experience for students, that's quite a feat. And she did super well with that. And that led to her being able to create events in the music space with people like Action Bronson, ASAP Ferg. But one of the things that she started to experience as a creator was discrimination with some of the venues that she would try to work with. So depending on what artists she would be trying to create these experiences with, she would get a lot of pushback. There would be a lot of opposition. So she decided to create her own event and content platform called 24 Hours. So it's 2-4 and it's O-U-R-S. And it's a event platform and content platform dedicated to the urban music space. So she is using that to give artists a platform to create, creating events for people who are music enthusiasts to come and engage. And she is making superpower moves with really creating an opportunity, not just for herself, but opening up the door for other people to have a space to create and collaborate. So today's power move goes to Boldy Harris. Well, that's excellent. Yeah, very exciting. And where can we find more about her platform? Yes, yeah, so you can go to 24 hours. So it's O-U-R-S dot com. And, and there's everything about the platform there. Her story is there and she's doing a lot of amazing things as a creator in the content space. And Fireside is next. Yay. So for those of you who haven't heard me explain this before, well, I'll give my 10 second pitch. Do you want to be part of history, but also a part of the future too? Join me on the first ever small business video directory. Fireside is a small business video directory. I interview people and I put them on my YouTube channel and on my website and I will start promoting it soon. And I've been building. So actually Jack and Kenya and Lee have all shot videos with me and I enjoy doing the videos, but things are changing. People are getting so much more comfortable on video than when I started this a year ago. And so I've almost got a hundred people so I can really start promoting the site. One of the things I've done to promote the site, besides talking about it on past to profit and social media of my own is I started an Instagram channel about cats. So everybody loves animals, right? So Jack, you're saying, how do you get the word out? Well, I'm going to be using the cat channel to promote fireside people. And and I've been accumulating followers. And also for the videos I do to Misty's point, I think this was so important. And you said it, we kind of glossed over. I tell people in their videos, you have 10 seconds to capture Mm -hmm. people's interest. So if you're doing something different with your business, I want to hear in the first 10 seconds what you're doing, because basically that's what you got these days, right? Mm -hmm. So I interview people myself. I have another gal interviewing people. I have a videographer who reached out to me to do interviews for me. Um, I have another videographer I've talked about, maybe putting some of his business videos. So I see this moving beyond me doing the videos to being more of a tech project where I just manage the placement of the videos on the site and the revenue stream I had worked out one way, but after talking to people, I may change it. It's all free right now because I'm building it. I, I can't really give a lot of value to people, but that's where we're at. Well, that sounds great. Your social channel is cats who wear hats. I followed you the other day. Yeah. Cats who wear hats. And we (laughs) interviewed our cat checkers who has been on this show, by the way. And Richard is the voice of Checkers. She, I was hoping you wouldn't tell people that. <laughs> we have the 38 second interview of Checkers on our Instagram channel. I'm interviewing her and she was not very nice to me. <laughs> she is a sweet cat, but. <laughs> and she, she has a mind of her own. So with that, let's move on. <laughs> so, All right. I am really delighted. You know, 
we talked to people on this show and I was like, where were you when my kids were little? And <laughs> have really, if you have children that you need to get moved around from place to place with a trustworthy person, Sarah Share has the app for you. So I'm not going to say anything more about it. Sarah, tell us what you're doing. You have couple minutes to talk and then we'll ask questions. Absolutely. And thanks so much for having me. It's been amazing hearing the other contributors as well. I think I have a lot in common from consulting to cats to horses um, with all of you. But uh, in this case, yes, um, I'm the founder and CEO of Kango, uh, which is Safe Rides and Care for Kids. Um, it's actually the third startup that I have worked at, but the first that I've co-founded. And the way that came about was uh, actually, at the previous startup, snapfish.com, which was acquired by HP, it was the dawn of digital photography when digital cameras were a new thing and, and smartphones didn't even exist yet. Um, I was running a global product management team across 22 countries and a bunch of different time zones. And I had become a mom along the way. And I had two preschoolers. And for the life of me, I could not figure out how to manage their schedules now that they needed to go outside the home to preschool and back, you know, on a daily basis. My husband worked over an hour away um, down the peninsula. I'm in San Francisco. This was terrible traffic and all existing childcare uh, solutions that I tried just were not built for transportation. So I ended up leaving Snapfish after building it into, you know, what was a really exciting multinational online photo and video company and took the plunge. I stepped off the ledge and co-founded Kango with the one of the former you know, lead engineers that I worked with um, in product management at Snapfish. And so um, it was the dawn of smartphones at the time. Um, we didn't exactly know what the product uh, and the company would be, but I just had this incredible pain in my life that everyone seemed to share as a parent how do you get your kids safely where they need to go in a way that is trustworthy, trackable, where the vetting, which is a key part, is taken care of for you? And really the concept of it takes a village, you know, which is still true, uh, but with a smartphone now, is there a way to put that in your pocket, you know, so that you can take that with you and have that? So we first had a number of sort of trial and error moments. Um, we built, uh, being product and engineering, we built um, smartphone apps to at first allow parents to connect with each other and uh, trade rides or carpool together. But pretty quickly, it became apparent from all the customer feedback that, yes, this was a universal challenge. Uh, yes, indeed, there was no good solution for this. Um, and that, you know, while smartphones were cool, this was really not just voice, text and data. This was about kids and you needed people. But what that came down to was parents kept asking us, well, I don't have anyone I can carpool with or my carpool fell apart. Do you have drivers that you can supply? Have you done the vetting? I don't have an idea as a parent, you know, how to get someone fingerprinted and background checked and get their vehicle inspected. And what about insurance? And so that's really where we saw the value that people were willing to pay for. And that was going to be a viable solution for the you know, huge challenge that was really kind of jeopardizing women's careers, you know, putting marriages under tension, uh, keeping kids from going to activities. And in my own, you know, early childhood, I can remember being taken, you know, from age four onward, you know, to horseback riding, which was my sport, actually. <laughs> and so it really was a huge problem that I was deeply passionate about solving. So we could go into more detail, but our first round of funding came from an accelerator, uh, 500 startups up here in the Bay Area. We pivoted into what became you know, a ride-sharing company. So we are a ride-sharing company, but we are also a licensed childcare provider. And so all of our drivers have childcare experience. Yes, it has the convenience of an Uber. Sometimes we've been called Uber for kids, but it really is more childcare on wheels. So you can download Kango from the app store on iPhone or Android, you can book childcare, you can book rides, you can do it on demand, or you can schedule a regular driver. Uh, we pride ourselves on having a very personal touch um, and also being licensed and insured to transport kids of any age from you know, babies needing car seats, which we supply to high schoolers who maybe, you know, have a, a dance that they need to safely get home from um, at night. 
Don't and so um, that's what we provide now up and down the state of California, from San Francisco down to San Diego, and also in Arizona. That Sweet sounds question. fantastic. I'm just curious, is it the same driver for the family every time, or is there switching off between drivers? Because I would think that if you're carrying kids, it's better if they have some consistency. Yes, absolutely. We really are tailored to whatever parents' preferences are. So we have families who have, um, and the system is built to accommodate that. So you can set preferences to have only one driver. And we recommend that you rent your rides in advance so that we can try to reserve that person for you. You can have a smaller pool of maybe one to three drivers that rotate um, if you have a lot of needs um, or really, you know, kind of want to maximize uh, the chance of having a driver whenever you need one. And then we have parents actually more uh, more parents than not, the, the vast majority leave it up to Kango. Um, and that happens sometimes over time. Um, they realize that there's so much vetting that goes into finding these caregivers who happen to be safe drivers with you know spotless driving records. But we have the whole spectrum. You can have just one driver or you can have a pool of preferred drivers or you can leave it up to Kango. It's up to you. So you said you're in California and now into Arizona. What is your ultimate goal? Is this going to be countrywide, worldwide? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> Well, certainly, I mean, and I'm actually half Swiss, uh, my, my experience, and I lived in, in Belgium and France, um, you know, as both a child and a, and a young adult, I'm going to business school. So I believe strongly that the need is global. There's some, you know, market variations. So that would be the pie in the sky, so to speak, but certainly, you know, national as, as a next step or even more multi-state um, than we are now. Um, in fact, we have parents downloading the app or calling us or chatting with customer service every day asking, you know, I can't believe, why are you not in Nashville? You know, why are you not in Atlanta? Um, how can I book a ride? People actually trying to book a ride from across the country. So we know the demand is there. Do you envision franchising this concept? Yeah, that's a question that we've gotten. Um, it's a great one. A couple of concerns we have. So we have not, you know, to date, uh, we've had a lot of requests actually to either franchise or license the app. It's a pretty complicated system. The amount of control though, that we feel is necessary for safety um, and security reasons uh -huh. is at a level where we haven't worked through, you know, whether frankly, there's any setup that we would be comfortable handing off that responsibility, you know, to a franchisee. It's not impossible, but we haven't crossed that bridge at this point. What's your biggest challenge? I think the biggest challenge is frankly, meeting demand. It takes uh, quite a bit of, of work to vet and scale, you know, with the amount of background checking and fingerprinting and, you know, childcare experience required. There's a vast pool of folks who are qualified to do the work. Not all of them have qualifying vehicles, but, you know, I'm happy to report that the largest problem other than, you know, startup funding initially to get the business off the ground and to some degree to also continue to grow. It's really been meeting demand. So there's, it's an interesting type of business. Um, it's got peak periods when kids are all going to school in the morning and coming home from school in the afternoon. So you have to work around that. One of the reasons why we also uh, carry the younger kids who might get out of preschool at, at 10 or 12 rather than 3 p.m., um, so, you know, scaling or meeting demand um, as quickly as there is demand and still remaining in a stage that we call responsible growth, because this is kids, has really been the, the, the largest challenge. But it also is a reflection of the opportunity that's out there. Sarah, um, I saw it, so. that you um, partnered with, Kango partnered with Chrysler. True. Uh, that's an interesting partnership. And I believe that there was talk earlier on the show about synergies and, and resources. They picked Kango for a first and only to the state of its kind. Um, partnership where um, they provided Kango drivers, handpicked select you know, drivers with uh, Kango branded Pacifica uh, hybrid minivans, which are a great match in terms of being great mileage for drivers and also great branding for us. And at the same time, putting the target market, namely parents and kids, um, in front and inside of those vehicles that had just launched at the time. And we learned a lot about fleet management from our partners at Chrysler without having to own or purchase the fleet, which was really a win-win, you know, all around. And the kids simply love those vehicles. So Sarah, can you tell me how you came up with your name? It's kind of like kangaroo, like the baby in the pouch. Is that what you're Oh thinking? my gosh. Um, naming was really hard. Um, we were looking because we're a service and a consumer brand, you know, uh, service for kids and families. 
We wanted an animal mascot um, because it would be something that was easily recognizable. There's a Kango emblem on the front and back of each uh, vehicle. And there's uh, all drivers wear a Kango t-shirt with a big kangaroo on it. We wanted it to be recognizable even by small kids who couldn't necessarily read um, and recognizable at a distance, you know, as vehicles pull up in the pickup line or carpool line at schools. Uh, so we wanted an animal mascot. We wanted something that had energy and was dynamic and known for moving around, but also that had a little bit of a softer side than what better than a kangaroo that actually carries its young. We had some, uh, we had a, a first iteration. It was called Kangadoo at the very beginning uh, because we weren't sure what exactly the, the service was that we were going to land on. It ended up being um, pretty much transportation is the bread and butter, but that was too difficult. It was too many syllables. People weren't sure how to write it, um, if they heard it, and then if they saw it written, they weren't sure how to pronounce it. So we actually went through a branding boot camp sponsored by one of our investors um, with Goodby Silverstein. And we came out of a really tough weekend, but delighted with, all right, it's can go plus you literally can go. Yeah. So that's how that's we right. uh, ended up with can go. So can you spell the name real quick? K-A-N-G-O. So like can with a K, go, like going places in the app store and at kangoapp.com on the web. Passage to Profit, the Inventors Show on WOR 710, the voice of New York. We will be right back. Hi, I'm Lisa Askley, the Inventress, founder, CEO, and president of Inventing A to Z. I've been inventing products for over 38 years, hundreds of products later and dozens of patents. I help people develop products and put them on the market from concept to fruition. I bring them to some of the top shopping networks in the world, QVC, HSN, Evine Live, and retail stores. Have you ever said to yourself, someone should invent that thing? Well, I say, why not make it you? If you want to know how to develop a product from concept to fruition the right way, contact me, Lisa Askeles, the inventress. Go to inventing a toz.com inventing a to z.com email me lisa at inventing a to z.com treat yourself to a day chock full of networking education music shopping and fun go to my website inventing a toz.com now back to passage to profit once again richard and elizabeth gearhart if you are just tuning in wow you missed some great content here so it will be on our podcast tomorrow on iheart and it will be on our youtube channel if you want to see some of the things that we're talking about, and that is Passage to Profit on YouTube. But now I have had the lucky opportunity to interview Lee Torres for my fireside site. And if you are an entrepreneur and you are selling anything that is a product that you need to ship, you need to talk to Lee because <laughs> Lee can save you big bucks. So welcome, Lee. Tell us all about your company. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you guys for the opportunity. It's been really great. Bellhop Logistics is the company name. I'm the founder and CEO of Bellhop. And we solve a problem that's been going on for decades in the industry, and that's volume. If you're a shipping company or a business or an entrepreneur, everything is based on volume. When, when you work with carriers like FedEx or UPS, think about someone that might be spending two, three, four, five million dollars in shipping a year. They still have a rep and maybe they get some Dodger tickets thrown at them and whatnot, but everybody's more focused on profit, right? Or profitability or the bottom line. So what we offer is a program that has no fees, no volume requirements, and no contracts for any type of shipper. I'm focusing my attention on the small to medium-sized businesses because that's truly the people, especially this year in 2020, that need the help, but our programs are geared to help people increase not only their profitability, but reduce the headaches and monotony that come with being a shipper. So aside from being able to save people money on services like FedEx, USPS, UPS, DHL, we also do freight and even import export across the ocean. So we, it's a full service logistics company, but what's more dear and near to our hearts is the service that we offer. It's actually the reason we call the company Bellhop. It kind of says in and of itself who we are and what we do uh, we want people to know that when they work with Bellhop, that they've arrived, that we're going to elevate their service and that we're going to help them kind of go down this path, especially if you're just starting. One of the, the quotes that I use very often is by the great Maya Angelou that says, you may not remember me for what it is that I said or what I did, but you will remember me for how I make you feel. And we're huge on making people feel confident taken care of and comfortable, and also having a place that they can come where they're not going to have to go through an 800 number or a call center or have to find somebody that's overseas, someone that's actually in their time zone or in their country, rather, that can actually help them kind of see things from a thousand feet up and help you make that left or right turn when you need to. So 
We're huge on service. We're huge on savings. I appreciate the opportunity. And that is a little bit about Bellhop. Wow, that's great. So how do you save money for small shippers? I, I assume that you're buying sort of chunks of shipping at a discount because you buy a large chunk or something. But how do the mechanics of that work? It's definitely based on negotiating power, Richard. I've partnered also with some companies that have the clout in the industry. So they're authorized resellers of programs like FedEx and DHL. So these programs, because they already retain so much volume, that means that our customers Customers don't have to have it. So whether you ship one package or you ship 10, they still are able to get that great discount because we already hold the volume with the carrier. So you don't have to. So well, it's like group insurance, basically. That's you know, a good analogy. You got a whole bunch of people doing the same thing and they pay less because then they're one big chunk. Exactly. You actually have on your website a calculator to calculate how much money you can save shipping with you versus just the regular way, right? That's right. Yeah. You just plug in the carrier and you plug in how many packages you're doing via ground or express or through USPS. It's a free look, really. It kind of gives you, and this is just based off of our averages and the client base that we have that we can kind of benchmark against. So we use that number and then you get a free look. And then we, we say, we don't spam. If you want to send uh, your email to us, We'll get back in touch with you and get in contact with how you can achieve that pretty easily. After I interviewed Lee, I talked to somebody who's a one-man shop who's doing promotional items who uses Lee. And I said to the guy, I said, is that really true? And he's like, yeah, you wouldn't believe how much money this guy has saved me. So <laughs> there was a testimonial. I so appreciate that. What is the average savings then? 10%, 20%? So I would say usually between 9 and 12%. We usually land around the 10% range. So I mean, you could see a company, well, I'll share a story. So I have a client that we just, uh, we just brought on about six to eight weeks ago. They're a company in Las Vegas. They do apparel. They actually do these great adult onesies that you can put on. So if you want to look like a giraffe or a kangaroo, uh, <laughs> yeah, a kangaroo. And they were shipping, they were with a program with UPS and they were shipping about two and a half million dollars per year. That's just their shipping spend, two and a half million dollars. And so we came in, we did our analysis, we crunched the numbers, switched them to a program with FedEx and are now saving them over $18,000 a month. It's almost a, a quarter of a million dollars that we're able to save this company. And that's an injection right back into their bottom line. Now, we're also helping them from a service side. We offer them technology integration. Uh, we have shipping systems that help them integrate with Amazon, Shopify, Etsy, all that kind of stuff, all for free. And it's a blessing. I, I've been doing this for over 10 years now. Uh, not the company. The company actually started during the pandemic. But I've been in this industry. And it's really great when you can help a business owner or a business. It's helping their business grow. They can inject that back into the business and market, whatever it is that they, they choose to do that. But we've kind of now stopped the bleeding and give them an influx and in profit that they can enjoy month over month. It's awesome. I think you mentioned that you're also involved, you ship freight. Is there uh, a limit to the volume of freight that you can handle for a client? We do everything from, so from a domestic standpoint, it could be a pallet, it can be a full truckload. And from the international import export side, it can be a full 20 or 40 foot container coming from China, say, or from India or from South Africa, whatever it might be. We can help with all size, all weights. And yeah, there's really no limitation. But I'm marketing a lot to the small to medium sized businesses, more of the small package. So that's like right on my website. It's the landing page, but there's much more service to, to Misty's point that we can offer and we can move it up in the air by the ocean, by truck, by rail, all modes of transportation. What's your website, Lee? Bellhopship.com. No, and I appreciate your comments. I think it was really relatable, Jack, that you were saying earlier that service sometimes ends up being your competitive advantage. Yep. And that's where we're really big on that. And obviously, if you can save money to an extreme on top of being serviced and being pampered and taken care of, I think it's huge. And I think that going back to Miss D, you know, as far as content, like what you're putting out there, it's not just about, oh, we're saving your money. That's an easy thing. But putting that in a frame of mind where a CEO all the way down to the warehouse manager finds value in what you're talking about, I think is important. So content creation is huge, I think, and I agree with you. Guys. He's working with Gerhardt Law. I'm getting his trademark through. So we're right now in the midst of uh, negotiating with the trademark office to get his mark registered. But one of the things that he mentioned that I thought was really interesting was, is that a lot of people don't want to deal with shipping. I mean, you yeah. love shipping, but there are other people who find <laughs> filling out all the paperwork and everything a little bit tedious and you take care of all of that. So that's yeah. one less thing that a business owner has to worry about and they can concentrate on other aspects of their business. Exactly. I tell my clients, if it's going to take you more than five minutes on the phone, put it on us. 
That's what we're here for. We're all about fitting your model, not you fitting ours. So everything is custom. What's the best way to work with you in terms of making sure it makes sense? So yeah, making dollars and cents is important to us. So typically what we do on the front end is we get data from the client. And then we'll do an analysis and we'll actually forecast because we want to do a quarterly business review every quarter with you and make sure that we're hitting that mark just so that you can see the value, not only the dollar savings, but the value that we're offering you and what we know and how to benchmark this. So really it's analysis. Next step at that point is, you know, once you, you see that and you, you kind of feel comfortable with us, then we can move into, okay, how do we implement this? How do we need to integrate to your system? How can we make this easy on you? Because it isn't a flip of a switch. It's something that can take sometimes weeks just to make sure that we're training folks, that we're meeting folks, that we're coming in and we're, we're building a relationship really with you. We want to work with you decades down the line. So we're not only promoting businesses, we're helping consumers and business owners all over the planet, really, by the time we're done with this, right? So You are listening to Passage to Profit, The Inventor Show. If you missed this episode, you're just tuning in. It is on our podcast, our YouTube channel tomorrow. But you really missed a lot. You missed this. So make sure you go back and listen. We got it all covered tonight. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) We'll be right back. What are entrepreneurs' most valuable assets? Their passion and ideas. We can't protect your passion, but we can protect your ideas. Trust Gearheart Law to protect your ideas with premier patent, trademark, and copyright services. There's never been a better time to start your own business, contact us at GearHeartLaw.com. At GearHeart Law, we have years of experience protecting entrepreneurs' ideas and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at GearHeart Law, www.GearHeartLaw.com. Don't let the wrong protection strategy ruin your business. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection and are licensed and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Contact Gearheart Law on the web at G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W dot com. Together, we can change the world. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. Now more with Richard and Elizabeth. Passage to Profit. I can't believe I'm so excited about shipping this evening and also mobile child care and equestrianism and media and all also networking. So I think we've done it all. Yeah. So I would just like to run through everybody's websites or how to reach them. So Misty is the owner of Wrigley Media Group. So Wrigley, like Mm -hmm. Wrigley Chewing Gum. Mm -hmm. So what is your website if people want to find you, Misty? WrigleyMediaGroup.com. That's easy. (laughs) Okay. That's logical. And they really help people with content and rising above the noise. Then we had Jack Killian, who has Street Smart Entrepreneurs. So you can find that at street-smartentrepreneurs.com. So kind of makes you feel tough, doesn't it? If you're a street smart entrepreneur. Yeah, you have to be. <laughs> I think he's giving you all the little secrets of the street that, you know, there you, go. you, you don't get from normal people. <laughs> he's a fighter. Not entrepreneur for thugs, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then I talked about Fireside, which is fireside.directory. And that's a small business video website. So I want it to be the Wikipedia of small business online by video. And then we had Sarah share with Kango app, K-A-N-G-O-A-P-P.com. So you can just look up Kango. So it's basically an Uber ride sharing service for kids, but it's not really, it's more like daycare for kids that includes rides. It's catching, it's like wildfire. She can't build it fast enough. Everybody wants it. We have Lee Torres with bellhopship.com so the bellhop part is the white glove treatment you get from his shipping company and the ship.com is that he ships around globally internationally nationally for small and medium businesses and get you the discount rates that the big companies get for shipping by pooling all of these companies, small companies together. So he can save you 10 to 12% on your shipping needs if you're a small to medium sized company. And that adds up really fast. And unfortunately we have to ship out shortly, but before we go- <laughs> We wanna ask for parting comments, right? We have a few parting comments. So Jack? I think uh, my parting advice to uh, entrepreneurs or would be entrepreneurs is to do it. Life is short. This isn't practice. And if you have a passion for something, I think you should try it. Great. And Misty? Oh, echoing what Jack said, that 
No, you have that passion. Don't be afraid. You have to trust in yourself and trust in your good instincts and just remember that passion and go for it. Excellent. Kenya? I agree with everyone here today. You know, I always live by this infamous quote, you don't happen to make it, you make it happen. So you just have to do it. And I think that everyone here today is a great representation of what it means to create, to collab, and to cultivate. So carry on. It's a very inspiring show tonight. Before we leave, I'd like to thank Noah Fleischman, our incredible producer who takes all of this and makes it sound really good. And also don't forget to like us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Especially, please follow us on YouTube so we can build our YouTube channel up so everybody can see these shows whenever they want and find them easily. Absolutely. And so this is Richard and Elizabeth Gerhardt with Passage to Profit on iHeartRadio, coming to you on WOR 710, the voice of New York. <laughs>